And Dr. Hernandez, in your book, you remind us it is possible for a historically marginalized group to both experience discrimination and be discriminatory. There are specific dynamics to what happens in L.A., but what can it tell us more broadly? Well, the problem is that if we don't have all communities, Latino included, address their own anti-Black bias that is not necessarily of the United States, you know, comes with us from much earlier, from Latin American and Caribbean histories of colonialism that keep continue to be perpetrated long after the abolition of slavery, that all of us are sort of implicated in global anti-Black ideologies. But if we don't confront them because we have this attitude that, oh, we also experience bias and discrimination, so somehow that's like a Teflon shield against any accountability, that only allows the problematic dynamics to continue unabated. I mean, Dr. Hernandez, some of that work begins at home. It begins with hard conversations we have with people we love. I wonder what you think that looks like in the public sphere. In the public sphere, that means no longer hiding behind the notion of all people of color are inherently in community. Community is something that is built. Community is not something that miraculously mm -hmm. happens, right? Um, we all have to put our best foot forward in order for that to happen. It's just like when you're in family, it doesn't feel like family unless people intend put intentionality behind it. Community is built. I love that. But you see, among the remarks in that leaked audio, there was the now former council president calling indigenous immigrants from the Mexican state of Oaxaca tan feos. As you write, a simple Google Translate will tell you it means so ugly, but it won't give you the context and long history of racial slander these two words carry. I was once again a young girl from Oaxaca feeling less than my fellow Mexicans. Tell me more. You know, I think when people look at me right now on TV, probably think, look at this girl with blonde hair, right? <laughs> what does she know about uh, racism, <laughs> colorism? Um, I was born in Oaxaca, raised there in Mochole when I was 10 years old. And through my entire life, I've noticed the privilege that I hold um, between my, mine and my siblings. My, um, I'm the lightest skin out of the four of us. But I think that what people don't understand is that when you're from Oaxaca, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter the fact, the mere fact that you're from Oaxaca, that you say you're from Oaxaca, when you are in Mexico, you are automatically put as someone who is less than the other fellow Mexicans. I experienced it myself growing up. My sister and my brother experienced it on a daily basis. And... I wrote this piece because I wanted to share with the world the reality of what it's like being indigenous and always being left behind. But I also wanted to write this piece because I wanted to make sure that little girls who were listening to this woman's words did not believe her. And I think that that's my message. Yeah. I think that I always believed the message that I was less than because I was from Oaxaca. And I think that right now our culture is so powerful and our ancestors gave us so much power. So I just want little girls and little boys out there who are from Oaxaca and who are of indigenous background and culture to stand today in their power and to think of themselves and to know how beautiful they are.